Good evening, everyone. Tonight's Good Friday service is called a tenebrae service, where tenebrae means, in Latin, darkness or shadow. It's a somber service that the church has been practicing since the Middle Ages, since the medieval times. So by having this liturgy, we are participating with the church at large um, in the church that's been a part, that's been doing this for a, a long time. So there are two parts to tonight's service. The first is what's called the service of the word, where there's going to be a brief sermon preached. The second part of the service is what's called the service of shadows. That's the tenebrae part, where there's going to be readings from scripture that trace the story of Christ's passion meaning his suffering and his death. And then after each reading, one of the candlelights will be extinguished. That's so we can let the depth of Christ's suffering and death sink in. There will be one candlelight at the, end, at the end of the service, and you'll see why. And then after we're dismissed, um, please exit the sanctuary in silence. But come back on Sunday at seven for Easter sunrise service, and then at 11 during our normal times for worship. That's where we no longer have to be silent to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Please stand. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Please remain standing as we move into our, our hymn, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, number 221 in the hymnal. Oh, 
may be seated. Tonight's scripture reading comes from Hebrews chapter 4 and Hebrews chapter 5. Starting with verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Chapter five, verse seven. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd still our hearts and give us eyes and ears to see our Savior, our Lord, on a cross. The Savior, the Son of Man, who came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's the cross that casts the shadow over every story about Jesus. Starting from Advent, to Christmas, to Epiphany. You remember Jesus' compassion you remember how Jesus loves and embraces children, and you remember his care for people, how he healed them, how he fed them, and how he had the authority and the power to cast out demons, how he forgave sins. The thing that stitches all those stories about Jesus together is his itinerary, all roads of the gospel lead to the cross. We've been, as a church, we've been marinating in the gospel story since the end of uh, November last year, and it's been a long, slow cook. Since then, we've, we've seen some themes come up as we've gone through these stories about Jesus. Like this one. When you're associated with Jesus, you have to bear the shame for the sake of his name. But there's hope in the hurt. And another theme is, when light shines into darkness, it exposes what's already there. But there's a purpose to that painful exposure. These themes seem to have come up again and again as we've gone through passage of scripture. And that's because everything in scripture is about Jesus. Everything in scripture finds its completion in Jesus. Just like the Beatitudes describe Jesus' life as being blessed. Just like Psalm 23 in the path of that shepherd, of that sheep, describes the life and the path of Jesus. Tonight, in light of Psalm 23, we're gonna sit in the valley of the shadow of death. Tonight, we're gonna listen to how Jesus lives out every single one of the Beatitudes when he's dying on the cross. So who is Jesus and why did he die on a cross? The people in the city asked, who is this when Jesus 
finally got to his destination in Jerusalem. Who is this? It's really a question about who's in charge or what authority are you doing all these things? Remember the, the Roman Empire right? during Jesus' time, the government that was really in charge, they didn't approve of Jesus being king over anything. The religious leaders in Jerusalem, they didn't recognize Jesus' authority as a prophet. And when Jesus arrives in the temple in Jerusalem, the religious leaders there asked, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But those weren't sincere questions. Those weren't questions asked in good faith. That's why Jesus never gave a straight answer. If they had been asking in good faith, then they'd have to have faith in an obscure, non-authorized, credential-lacking northerner who spoke with a Galilean accent. Jesus arriving in Jerusalem was the light shining in the darkness. And it was a painful exposure for those who were in charge, including Satan himself. So they retaliated. They welcomed God's prophet and king to the city by subjecting Jesus to his own painful exposure, crucifixion. Listen to this description of the painful exposure and their retaliation. Quote, in the process of Jesus being condemned and crucified, human injustice was exposed as a system which operated through treachery, perjury, cruelty, and corruption. It was satanic. An instance of the one who had the power of death, Satan, exercising his power through a patriarchal judicial system stamped with his own image, end quote. But just like one of the themes that have been coming up, there's purpose in the painful exposure. One of God's purposes is what we just read in the book of Hebrews. The people in charge thought they got a, a self-ordained prophet and king off their plate. The threat was neutralized, right? Well, maybe. Jesus really was God's prophet and king. What they didn't realize was that Jesus was also God's high priest. And they killed him. They crucified God's high priest. But here's the thing. Here's, here's the irony. They thought they could maintain their power and authority over the things of God. But by crucifying Jesus, by crucifying Jesus, they effectively did a bypass surgery to open up a new path to access God around themselves. Jesus became the way to God's throne of grace. It's not through the congested labyrinth of man-made teachings anymore. It's not through the temple building and rituals anymore. The way to God is through the person of Jesus. Oh, going back to that quote about Jesus' trial and death. But it was the very injustice of the judicial condemnation which destroyed the foundations of Satan's kingdom. Only by an unjust sentence could Christ have died. And without his death, there could have been no redemption. But at the same time, the judgment passed on Jesus 
is also a judgment passed on Pontius Pilate, and as such, it places every human injustice system in the dock, end quote. The irony is that the people in charge by killing Jesus undermined themselves. The crucifixion was purposed by God with surgical precision to expose an unjust and already condemned world. Who is this? That's a question we can answer a little more fully tonight again. Jesus is God's prophet. Jesus is God's king. Jesus is also God's priest. And based on just a few passages of Hebrews we read tonight, Jesus is our lowly high priest. He's lowly because like us, he lived the Psalm 23 journey in the valleys of the shadow of death, whether that was in the wilderness when he was tempted by Satan, whether that was in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying to God to ask if there were any other way around crucifixion, he would receive it, but not his will, but God's will be done. Or whether or not the valley of the shadow of death was on the cross itself, Jesus was tempted and, quote, felt the tug of sin, just like we do. But as it says in our passage, he didn't sin. How else can Jesus save and help if he's not in a position of strength while we're in a position of helplessness? He knows you. He sees you. He sees you in your weakness, just like a good shepherd sees his sheep. He also sees and knows about your sin. That's what makes him a good priest. So he prayed. He cried to God who could have saved him from death, just like we do when we need mercy when we need help. Jesus also obeyed his father in the real stuff of life. It was through suffering where scripture says he learned obedience, where he exercised his obedience. The eternal son of God obeyed so that he can be the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. We obey him because God anointed and appointed him to be our high priest. He authorized Jesus because of his obedience as our lowly high priest. Obedience to the point of death, even death on a cross. And there was hope for Jesus. There was hope for Jesus in the hurt. There was hope for him on the cross. Our passage tells us God the Father heard Jesus pray and cry out to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard. Jesus was heard because of his reverence. Jesus did suffer and die with hope in the hurt. Jesus' quote unquote salvation from death didn't take place until three days later. Like one of our themes from since Advent, you've got to put your hope not in when, but in whom, but in him. So come back on Easter to celebrate the three days later together. Let's pray. God, 
we wait with you to offer the hope and the hurt that comes from the cross to earth's darkest places where pain is deep and affection is denied. Let love break through. Where justice is destroyed, let sensitivity to right spring up. Where hope is crucified, let faith persist. Where peace has no chance, let passion live on. Where truth is trampled underfoot, let the struggle continue. Where fear paralyzes, let forgiveness break through. Eternal God, reach into the silent darkness of our souls with the radiance of the cross. O oh, you who are the bearer of all pain, have mercy on us. Giver of life, have mercy on us. Merciful God, have mercy on us. Amen. We will now begin what is uh, deemed the service of the shadow. And you'll see we go through various stages of the shadows through which Jesus um, walked. The first reading is the shadow of betrayal. The reading is Matthew 26, <clears throat> verses 20 through 25. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. in the shadow of agony and of spirit and arrest. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit's indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he, and again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, 
sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let's be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Certainly, you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me. The shadow of accusation. Now, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor, sa- the governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who's called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing 
but rather that a riot was beginning. He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. The shadow of death. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Ali, Ali, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again 
with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his res- resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Please stay seated as we sing together about the death of Jesus. The shadow of burial. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Were you there when they crucified my
to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you Tremble, were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Let's stand together and finish our song about our Savior who died. May Jesus Christ, who for our sakes became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross,
keep you and strengthen you. Amen. Amen.